Hey everybody, Eric here. Hopefully all is well with all of y'all. Uh, as always, thank you so much for listening to the show. Have a few announcements here of where you can find me and the show for October. So on October 1st, I will be having a tent with Mr. Alan Searcy, friend of the show, paranormal author at the Fall Fest in Gallatin, Tennessee, downtown Gallatin. So come see us, grab some paranormal merchandise, grab a book from Alan who will even sign it for you, and just come by and talk some paranormal with both of us. And then on October 14th, I have teamed up with Southern Gothic, the podcast, host Brandon Sheck Snyder. We will be bringing both of our shows, the Unseen Paranormal Podcast and Southern Gothic, live to the stage at the Palace Theater in Gallatin, Tennessee. Like I said, that's October 14th. You can get tickets at southerngothicmedia.com or at unseenparanormalpodcast.com. We're going to have a lot of fun that night. I will have a guest live on stage when we talk about the history and hauntings of the Palace Theater and Gallatin in general. And then on October 22nd, we're doing the awesome Paracon in Lebanon, Tennessee at the Wilson County Fairgrounds, the Phantom Paws and Historic Calls Paracon. Come join me in the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. We will be the featured podcast at the event. And I will be up on stage talking about small town haunts and legends of Tennessee. And we have some awesome speakers that we're going to announce here very soon for that Paracon. And uh, so come on out. It'll be a day of fun. Tickets will be $10 at the door. And we will be there from 10 to 6. And then on October 29th, you can come out and see me and Alex Cersei again. We'll have a tent at the Franklin Pumpkin Festival in downtown Franklin, Tennessee. Once again, we'll have paranormal merchandise available Alan will be there signing books. I'll be there just to talk about the paranormal. Come by, meet me, meet Mr. Alan Searcy from Southern Ghost Stories. And uh, stay tuned. I may have some other public events coming up in the month of October. It is the busy time for paranormal, and it is the spooky season. So keep in touch on the social media pages to find out what else is going on. Enjoy the show. Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangeness of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Today we welcome researcher and author Pat Fitzhugh. Pat's research into the famous Adams, Tennessee legend of the Bell Witch has spanned four decades and he has authored two books on the subject. The Bell Witch Haunting, and The Bell Witch, The Full Account. He has contributed to many publications on the subject and appeared in productions from the History Channel, the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel, and many more. For more information on Pat Fitzhugh, check out his website, bellwitch.org, and his books are available there and on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. And I'll put the links in the show notes as usual. Hey, Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Eric. Glad to be here. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? Oh, doing fair to Midland, I guess, just hanging in here, kind of getting adjusted to this uh, slight weather change here in Tennessee, and just kind of looking over my back to make sure the old bell witch not chasing me. <laughs> yeah, it is the season. All right, so you've been doing research for, for over 40 years into this, uh, this legend. So how did you get into doing the research, and what got you interested in the bell witch and the research? Well, as a child, my mother would tell me different stories at bedtime, and a lot of times I had trouble sleeping, and for some reason, one night, she started telling me this bell witch story, and for an even more odd reason, that actually calmed me down, and so uh, she kept (laughs) doing that, and she bought a bell witch book called The Bell Witch at Adams, which was actually a bell witch children's book, and would read that to me, and time, I learned that the characters and places in the legend were real, and that she had even gone to school with some of the descendants of the people involved in the actual Bell Witch legend. So I thought that was pretty cool, and and a few years later, when I was a little bit older kid, I set out to kind of separate fact and fiction, and those early research trips... Uh, entailed uh, going to local libraries like in Nashville, Tennessee, and Springfield, not far from Adams, and trying to, you know, not only read all the books, but more importantly, see what kind of records or old papers they might have been holding, you know, that describe more about the people involved in the legend, 
uh, including the Bell family and about the places. And I just took it from there and have been doing that now for the last um, 44 years, uh, not just in libraries, but interviewing people, doing archive searches, newspaper searches, and uh, a whole lot of analysis of the uh, evidence and information that has come to light throughout the research. Yeah, that's pretty awesome because I'm, I'm from Middle Tennessee here too. And I've heard this legend my entire life as well. And, you know, I like to get down to the nitty gritty of what is, like you're saying, what's fact and what's legend. What can we prove about what happened with the Bell Witch and, and what is total fabrication and, and folklore? So for people listening who don't know the story of the Bell Witch, what's the actual legend that people are used to? Well, the traditional legend states that uh, the John Bell family of Red River which was an early pioneer community on the Red River in uh, northwestern Robertson County, Tennessee, uh, in the early 1800s, experienced a series of very strange and often malevolent events at the hands of a sinister entity that was nicknamed Kate. And these events began very quietly, with a little bit of scratching on the floors and the wall, occasional tap on the wall, and eventually grew to the point where the children were feeling their bed covers being pulled back, hearing things like chains being dragged across the floor, and even reached one point in the early days of disturbances where Betsy Bell, the daughter, was even slapped in her face as she lay in bed. And over time, as more and more things happened, and the Bell family became more and more afraid. This thing seemed to feed off of that fear and grow. And eventually, the thing was speaking in, or trying to speak in faint whispering tones that you could even understand. And then over time, that whispering turned into understandable words. And, of course, Mr. Bell didn't want anything being told about this outside of just himself and his neighbor, James Johnson, and his preacher, because Lord only knew what would happen to him. I mean, this was 125 years after the Salem Bridge trials, and people would just think, you know, he's unholy and all that because he has a supernatural entity living in his home. Right. And not to mention the fact that he was also an elder of the Red River Baptist Church. Well, these demonstrations that the family was having to endure were so great that the secret got out. And people came from all over the place to try and see what this thing was or to try and debunk it. And all throughout that time, as the Bells had more and more visitors, this thing became even more clear in its speech would uh, send people on wild goose chases when it would be asked what it was and would continue pulling pranks on people, hitting people, kicking the furniture out from underneath people, appearing as strange-looking animals on the field, only to show up in the living room as a disembodied voice every night and laugh about how people had reacted. It once allegedly quoted two different preachers' church sermons that were being given at the exact same time, 17 miles apart. And at one point, one of the preachers asked this thing, who, what it was, and what did it want, in such a way that the truth was apparently or supposedly the only correct answer. And it said that it was old Kate Batts' witch, and it was there to kill John Bell and make John Bell die the slowest, most miserable death possible. And people had a hard time believing that part, but they didn't have a hard time believing that Kate Batts had something to do with it. Kate Batts was a lady who lived about two, three miles away from the Bell Farm. And unlike most of the settlers in the Red River Settlement, her family had hardly any money. Uh, her husband, Frederick, had been the uh, 
you know, been a farmer and they were doing really well with their crops and everything, but then he became paralyzed and couldn't work, which left Mrs. Batts and her five kids to try and run the farm. So she was kind of an outcast because of that, you know, socioeconomic, and some people felt that she was crazy because she always used a bunch of crazy words when she was talking and you know, people, some of those people just didn't think she was all there, so to speak. So the part about this thing claiming to be Kate Bats, you know, people were like, yeah, okay, that makes sense because that lady's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So, and that actually became one of the biggest and most untrue myths associated with a legend. But we'll talk more on that later. But. You know, people were asking this thing, why did it want to kill John Bell? And it never could give a clear answer. It would just say he's not a good man or he needs to die. But that was it. And as time went on, Mr. Bell became started to become ill with what appears to be central nervous system issues. Then more and more people came to investigate. And one story says that Major General Andrew Jackson uh, went to the Bell Farm to investigate. And during the course of that visit, one of Jackson's men pulled out a pistol and said he had a silver bullet in there. And as long as the silver bullet was in there, that the Bell Witch would not make an appearance or cause any trouble because it was afraid of him. And about that time, according to legend, the band was slapped in the face then kicked in the behind and flew right out the door. Then later that evening, this mysterious entity, call it Kate, call it the Bell Witch, whatever you want to call it, told Jackson that there was another fraud at his party and he would and that it would expose that fraud the next night. So, of course, Jackson's men all wanted to get out of there, but Jackson insisted on staying so he could find out who the fraud was. But for some odd reason, Jackson changed his mind in the middle of the night, and they were seen going through Springfield, Jackson and his men, seen going through Springfield the next day, bright and early, headed back to Nashville. And as John Bell's illness worsened, it seemed that the entity, Kate, would take more and more pleasure in talking bad about Mr. Bell and bragging how all of his sickness is the result of her and that she was glad he was dying such a miserable death. Well, also, about that time, the youngest daughter, Betsy Bell, who also bore the brunt of most all of the physical disturbances throughout the four-year period, became engaged to a young man in the community by the name of John Gardner. And everybody seemed to be happy that Joshua and Betsy engaged, except for Kate. Kate was furious and say, Betsy, don't marry Joshua. You'll never be happy. Well, all this went on and on. And the disturbances just grew increasingly worse. It didn't only happen at the Bell Hall. It didn't happen at night. People were telling about encounters with this thing than like a six square mile radius of the Bell Hall. Then in November of 1820, John Bell went out one morning to separate his hogs. Uh, they raised a lot of hogs. And he kept falling down and having seizures, and his shoes would come off his feet, or his boots would come off his feet. And his son tried to help him by putting on the boots, but then the boots would go flying off again. Meanwhile, the entity known as Kate, or the Bell Witch, would just laugh, laugh, and laugh, Mr. Bell. So after he returned home that afternoon, went inside, he never left the house again, at least not alive. Then on December 20th, 1820, John Bell died, and Kate was very happy and exclaimed that she had given him some poison from a vial of dark, mysterious liquid on the cupboard, and that that was what killed him. John Bell's funeral was one of the biggest things ever held in Robertson County. Preachers from three different churches uh, spoke, and as the mourners 
graveyard, Kate's voice could be heard singing, Row, 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 row me o, row me up a big old bottle of brandy o. You know, just really cheerful, really happy, as though she was celebrating. Then, after Mr. Bell was buried, the disturbances died down quite a bit. But Joshua and Betsy were still engaged. And on Easter Monday, that April of 1821, the entire community had a picnic down on the Red River banks. And it was there where this disembodied voice screamed into Betsy's ears over and over, don't marry Joshua, don't marry Joshua. And at that point, Betsy realized that if she went through with marrying Joshua, that Joshua himself may suffer the same fate that her father suffered at the hands of this mysterious entity. So Betsy broke it off with Joshua. And a short time later, by June of that year, 1821, the entity bade farewell and promised to return in seven years. And then it left very quickly. Now we fast forward seven years and people around the area began hearing little noises and strange things that were very similar to what was heard and experienced when Kate first arrived at the Bell Home back in 1817. But in 1828, those things subsided, and according to one version of the legend, this thing spent three nights at the home of John Bell Jr., who, in my opinion, was the only person who was not afraid of it, discussing the past, present, the future, and civilizations. And a lot of predictions were made by the Spirit, uh, some of which even came true, if you believe that the Spirit actually made those predictions. Yeah. And the last thing that was said to John Jr. before the departure was that it would return in 107 years, made it 1935, to John Bell's most direct descendant. And did it return in 1935? Did it ever leave the place to begin with? You know, I don't know. But, you know, even to this day, a lot of strange things are reported around that area, which lead many to believe it never left the place. Although the intensity of this strangeness experienced today is nowhere near along the lines of what was going on back in the early 1800s. And there's a lot of other stuff over there, historical things, uh, some a lot of bloodshed, uh, Native American attacks along the river, uh, Civil War skirmishes, uh, the Tennessee, Kentucky Tobacco Night Riders. Uh, a lot of things have happened in the area that were conducive to possible paranormal encounters that people are still experiencing today. So that's the Bell Witch legend in a very tiny nutshell. Yeah, and there's uh, it, it's funny because growing up in uh, in Middle Tennessee, I've heard variations on some of the stuff with the land dispute between Kate Batts and John Bell, and then she put a curse on him. And there's been other things with Kate Batts uh, being being part of this legend that she lived in the Bell Witch Cave. She owned the Bell Witch Cave, um, and that's how they kind of bring the cave into the, the story. But uh, all of the people in the story are real people, right? Yeah, the legend of the Bell Witch is one of the few, if not the only legend of its kind, to involve real people, where you can actually look up these people and find that they did live. So it's very unique in that regard. Yeah, and, and Kate Batts was a real person, but she really didn't have anything to do with the Bell family. Yeah, Kate Batts was very much a real person. She was a scapegoat in the legend, and the theory that Kate Batts was behind this or Kate Batts was haunting John Bell and all that was very clearly debunked about 20 years ago. But yet people are still going around, you know, telling that version, even though it has no basis in fact whatsoever. The real story behind that 
is that John Bell was involved in a business transaction with Benjamin Batts, who was Kate Batts's brother-in-law. And Mr. Bell was charged with usury or charging too much interest. And that dispute ultimately led to Mr. Bell's being excommunicated from the Red River Baptist Church. But again, that wasn't Kate Batts. It was um, her brother-in-law. And also another thing a lot of people probably aren't aware of is that Kate Batts was related to the Bell family. Kate Batts was John and Lucy Bell's niece. Actually, she was Lucy Bell's niece. She was the daughter of Lucy Bell, John Bell's wife's brother. So, you know, that's something people don't, a lot of people don't know either. But I don't feel that Kate Batts had anything to do with it. She was just a convenient scapegoat. And despite all of the recorded evidence and church records and all that, we have to prove it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Some people just think that that is the right version which I've never understood, but, you know, people can believe whatever they want to believe. But right. I'm going to stick with what I find, you know, on the actual records. And another another thing that I see people uh, kind of pointing to to prove the legend is that, you know, there's there's proof that Andrew Jackson went there and because he's part of the story, as you were telling. But um, from what I've seen, nobody's ever found proof in his writings or anybody else's writings of the people that he was with that he was ever even there. You know, the alleged Andrew Jackson encounter has got to be the most popular of all the Bell Witch stories. You know, I can't go anywhere to do a lecture or book signing or anything when I don't have a ton of people wanting to hear the Andrew Jackson story. And I think that's great. You know, that's one of my favorite Bell Witch stories, too. Awesome little story. But when I switch hats and put on my researcher hat, I have to say that's all it is. It's a story. There's no record or anything of him visiting the Bell Farm. But then again, an aspiring politician might not want to record something like that because his opponents could use it against him in an election. So there's that thought. Now, could he have visited the Bell Farm? Absolutely. He actually, Jackson, owned land a very short distance from the Bell Farm where he raised racing horses. And John Bell's sons, two of them, possibly three, fought under Jackson in the War of 1812. So did he have reason to be in the area? Sure. Did he have reason to stop by the John Bell home? Possibly so. But then we get back to the question, did he stop by the John Bell home and did he encounter the Bell Witch? And there's no proof that that part happened. But there is substantial evidence evidence in the forms of records from Jackson's early, you know, his actual papers and the historical society that show Jackson was not even in this part of the country during the period that he's supposed to supposed to have visited the Bell Farm and encountered the Bell Witch. So, you know, I think it's highly unlikely that Andrew Jackson actually encountered the Bell Witch. He was in a whole other part of the country at the time. Yeah, I had a friend who went to a uh, to a speaking engagement where an Andrew Jackson, uh, I, I don't know this person's name, but they're from one of the colleges and they've kind of been researching and kind of an expert on Andrew Jackson and his writings. And he went up and asked this person, you know, did did Andrew Jackson really go to the Bell Witch Farm? And, and this guy's, you know, like I said, is an expert on Andrew Jackson. And he's like, there is nothing that I've ever come across in my years and years of research, you know, that would even say that he was – anywhere near there, like you're saying, during the time of uh, when the Bell Witch was supposedly active. Yes, and I agree. I mean, could he have ever visited the Bell Farm? You know, certainly. I mean, because he owned land near the place, uh, the Bell sons had fought under him in the war. You know, sure, he could have visited. But, you know, the kicker here is, did he encounter the so-called Bell Witch? And records actually you know, the historical factual records put him many, many miles away from this region during the time of the Bell Witch disturbances. So, you know, as a storyteller, I'm glad to tell the story. I love to tell the story. People enjoy it. I love to entertain people with it. But as a researcher, you know, I'm not completely sure he ever encountered the Bell Witch. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I, I wanted to ask about that because, like I said, that's the biggest thing that I get people telling me, well, Andrew Jackson went there. 
But yeah, like you're saying, there's there's absolutely no evidence. And so, also the cave is open for tours, and that has kind of become the big tourist thing is the Bell Witch Cave, uh, because the the Bell family farm is is not really the house is not standing anymore. The bells are buried there, and there's a monument. But so, how does the cave factor into the legend and the and the folklore? Yeah, the Bell Witch Cave is on the or, or is on what was the southwest corner of John Bell's farm, and it factors into the legend in that uh, several ways. But I think the biggest is the story of where Betsy and some other young kids were playing in the cave. And a little boy got his head stuck between two rocks, and he couldn't get out. And he started panicking. And according to the legend, the cave suddenly lit up. Something freed this boy from between those rocks and dragged him all the way out of the cave to the very front over by the Red River. And then that night, when the entity known as Kate was having its nightly disembodied voice conference with whoever was in the Bell living room, it spoke of how she bet that that little rascal would never stick his head between two rocks again. So that's the biggest thing. There's other mentions of the cave uh, within the Bell Witch legend, and also there's history there, a lot of Native American history there. A lot of artifacts have been found. There are Native Americans uh, buried up above the place, and I know years ago, uh, the Tennessee Historical Society and some other people did a lot of uh, research on that. So it's rich in history. And also, I believe, but don't hold me to it, I believe that was the place where Jesse James's gang spent the night either before or after robbing the bank in nearby Russellville, Kentucky. And in addition to all the old stuff, there's a lot of stuff, but a lot of things still happen there in the cave that are very hard to explain. Uh, there's, of course, the anomalous photographs. Sometimes people see unexplainable mists. Uh, they hear whispers. And here recently, after the cave reopened after two years, it seems the activity has picked up. And some of the guides have actually felt, you know, being pushed even. So a lot of strange things happen in there. But when you look at it from a wide perspective, that cave is just a whole hodgepodge of a lot of historical and strange things. You know, not just the Bell Witch, but you've got the entire Native American and Native American spiritual aspect as well. Yeah, there's actual uh, stone box graves in the cave, right? I'm not sure of the kind that are above the cave. I would assume stone box uh, there's also uh, some graves I've heard that are on the side of the cave. There is a stone box grave there in the cave, and that grave was transplanted from nearby Red River. And what happened on that was when they were building the new road, Keysburg Road, or building a new bridge on that road, which was many years ago, they happened upon this Native American grave. And the skeleton was analyzed, and somebody, an archaeologist, or maybe it was the historical commission, concluded that that was a skeleton, most likely, of about a 12-year-old Native American girl. And they didn't have any room or really, you know, anything to do with the skeleton, so they wanted to think of a good place to bury it or rebury it. And the decision was made to rebury it there in the cave. So that's what that stone box grave comes from in the first room. I've never heard that story. I just know I've seen pictures of it when I've gone to visit the cave a long time ago, the, the box grave was in there. And so I, I think a lot of people have attributed some of the paranormal activity that goes on in there uh, with that box grave and kind of the, the burial of a native in there. Uh, one of the biggest stories that I've heard over the years, and I've kind of talked about uh, a few times on the show when the bell, Witch has come up is that people will send back, uh, stones and stuff to the the people that own the cave because they take them out and then they have like misfortune or bad luck. Yes, that absolutely happens and happens a lot. You know, they've had people, you know, call and all about all kinds of misfortune that has happened since they took rocks from the cave. And there have been people send 
rocks back and even take the rocks back there. It's just just amazing. It makes somebody wonder whether these rocks have some type of spiritual uh, residue or something on them, whereby somebody takes the rocks and, in effect, takes a spirit or part of a spirit home with them, so to speak. Yeah, I've heard of other locations around the country, too, that that kind of happens the same way. The uh, I know one of them out in Arizona, the Petrified uh, Forest, people will send back uh, little pieces of petrified wood they went took home as a souvenir, and they kind of have the, cl- the claims of the same thing. And there's other places around the world that, that have had that happen, too. Yeah, that has happened at other locations, too, and it's it's very eerie. You know, I don't know, you know, to what extent that spiritual activity can be attributed to the misfortunes. You know, bad things happen to people. Sometimes they think about what all they've done lately or what they could have done to cause it to happen. I always wonder, you know, if somebody takes a rock from the cave or from some other uh, spiritual location, they go home and something bad happens, they automatically blame it on that rock or something. You know, it's kind of hard to really differentiate whether there's really some type of spiritual thing going on with the item or it's just a case of hasty association where, okay, I just picked up this rock and then all of a sudden I fell down. Uh, right. Should I have not picked up that rock? You know, kind of a slippery slope and a very fine line there. Yeah, one of the other things that I've heard um, over the years, and I think there was even a TV show with one of the Bell Descendants, is that the uh, firstborn male in the in the generations of family is kind of cursed, and like there's this continuing Bell family curse. What what have you found out about that? And what do you think about that? I was in that show. It was called Cursed. It was a series on A and E. It involved two uh, people investigating the case. One a police officer and one a former military officer and investigator. And they had set out to look at the Bell Witch as a whodunit case, which I really liked that idea. And that's why I uh, agreed to be involved with that. And I acted as kind of a go-to person uh, about the legend. You know, if they were looking for some piece of evidence or something and they fell down, I would be the one to have to pick them up, dust them off, and say, you need to look here, you need to check this, you know, that sort of thing. You know, I was... Glad to help in that way. Now, as far as a curse is concerned, I've never been able to differentiate with any hard evidence between a curse and a coincidence. You know, curse versus coincidence. I don't know what to say about it, but, you know, it's it's easier to prove that something happened than it is something happened as a result of a curse, which I don't know if there's ever been any scientific research done to actually prove that such a thing as a curse exists and whether or not it's a simple case of things happening to some particular person or group of people in a certain pattern and people relating it back to some person or event from some time earlier that could have caused a curse. Uh, my initial take on the Bell Witch thing is the firstborn male member of any family any family is going to die, as is the second, third, and fourth, and the female. Everybody's going to die, um, I guess, unless you believe in reincarnation or something. So, right. you know, the notion that the firstborn male in a particular family is going to die, to me, sounds more like nature than a curse. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I think even with, like, the haunted objects, like you're talking about sending them back, I think if you look hard enough – for evidence of something, you'll find it. And I think that comes across in the paranormal a lot that people want to believe so bad that some of these things like curses exist and things like that, or they want to blame their misfortune on something that they can't see instead of their own actions. A lot of the times I think kind of plays into, to both of those. Yeah. uh, There's a lot of bias and confirmation bias and so on and so forth, not just in the paranormal world, but in, practically every aspect of our daily lives uh people even do that without even realizing you know they're doing it and you know to be a researcher or a credible researcher 
you have to remove the bias and not necessarily want it to be something paranormal as well as not necessarily wanting it to be anything natural, but being open to both possibilities and looking at everything uh, from the different angles instead of being predisposed to trying to find evidence that it something was paranormal or finding evidence that it absolutely was not. You know, bias has hurt a lot of researchers in a lot of different fields over the years. And, you know, like I said earlier, when I'm in storytelling mode, doing book signings and lectures and storytelling, I'm in storytelling mode and I'm biased because I'm telling the story, a spooky Southern folktale, trying to scare the bejeepers out of people. But when I'm in research mode, I'm unbiased. And I have to think, you know, does this particular object have some kind of curse on it? And I also have to think, is this person simply attributing something bad to this object because this object is the latest thing that came into their life? You know, I have to look at it from both angles and give it, you know, equal consideration and just follow where my research takes me. Yeah, and in the in the town of Adams, it's still a, a major, major thing. Uh, they do a, yeah. a Bell Witch Fall Festival every September and October. And, um, like you said, the cave is back open, uh, for people to go and tour and have their own experiences. And, uh, there's a lot of reports uh, from the tour guides and the people that own the place of, of paranormal activity, of course, uh, surrounding all this and the property itself. There's spook lights and all kinds of, uh, things on the property. But like you said, the, the property has more history than just the bell family living there. You have civil war history in that area. And you have all these other things that could contribute to some sort of haunting or paranormal activity. Yeah. And, you know, even though I'm a researcher and I'm unbiased, you know, I'm also the first to admit that a lot of strange, unexplainable things do happen in and around Adams uh, and including at the cave. I will mention one thing. I recently heard about a lady who took a rock from the cave and just suddenly had a freak accident and I believe broke her leg. And I think that was that was pretty odd too, but yeah, there's always a lot uh, going on around there. And when you know you look at the Native Americans, you look at the Tennessee, Kentucky tobacco night riders going around lynching people and killing them. Then you have the some Native American attacks along the Red River. Also, a Civil War skirmish about two miles away from there, and I think there were a few fatalities in that but i'm i'm not positive you know that was just a real what you would call turbulent area way back when and then the bell witch on top of that yeah have you uh in your research and going out to adams uh, so many times into the cave and the property you ever had any experiences with the paranormal out there or, or things that you can explain i've had quite a few things happen around adams tennessee that i can't explain I have shot video of rabbits playing in a field and then played the video back and the field is still there and the wind is still blowing, but the rabbits are no longer there. I um, had a case where I chased a rabbit up underneath a gravestone in a church graveyard. And when I slapped my hand on the gravestone to try to make the rabbit come out, uh, I heard a baby crying and screaming. And I thought it was a nearby baby, you know, like somebody had their window open in their house and there was a baby in there and the baby started squalling. But then I noticed the gravestone was actually the gravestone of a baby. So, you know, I thought that was kind of weird myself. I mean, there may have been a logical explanation, but, you know, ap after that happened, I never heard another squawk. And, you know, the rabbit thing, you know, the thing of significance to me, in addition to them just disappearing off a of video, which has happened to other people with other items on videos taken there before, too, is that all throughout the legend of the Bell Witch, this thing often manifested as a rabbit. Yeah, that's pretty interesting correlation uh, to have the rabbit thing. And, and like part of the legend is uh, this entity appeared with a, a rabbit's head. The dog rabbit animal with the body of a dog and head of a rabbit. Uh, there's several takes on that. I've heard shapeshifter. I've also heard of a Native American spirit called trickster. 
that this would fall under, as well as some of the other early Bell Witch happenings. But yeah, it's just amazing how a rabbit played into it. And then at certain parts of the legend, we also, a couple of parts actually, we hear about the ever-present in folklore, Black Dog, which originated over in England a long time ago in stories where people see a black dog or the black dog has an evil semblance. And in the Bell Witch, we have one of the Bell slaves going to another farm one night to see his wife, who worked over there, and encountering this giant black dog. And the dog was really, you know, harassing him and blocking his pathway, and he couldn't get through. So he took his axe and split that dog's head. And, of course, that killed the dog, or so he thought. But then, according to legend, he goes... The same slave goes through the same path again, and I'll be darned. The dog is there again, but this time it has two heads from where the head had been split open, and it had a sharp pointed tail, and it turned out to be a manifestation of the Bell Witch. So, yeah, a lot of very eerie things uh, happened around there. Yeah, and the story is, is interesting because it's got so many elements from the paranormal like in that, you're talking about like cryptid elements, and then you have, of course, the poltergeist stuff and the possible possession, and then the the haunting, and and just so many different facets to this legend that is still fascinates people. Like I said to this day, because with the festival coming up in Adams, and many people still travel to the the cave to check it out. But the property, the cave, you can go tour, but the actual like Bell Farm property is private property, right? That's correct. The Bell Farm was split up into a lot of separate tracks. The cave is on a tract of the Bell Farm that is open. Uh, of course, during, during their hours, they're open, as is the Adams Museum on Highway 41. Uh, that is also on the old Bell Farm. The rest of it is, you know, privately owned, and the tract where the actual house, well, and Bell Cemetery were is actually still in the in the family and owned through a private trust foundation. And they lease that land out uh, for farming purposes, and they're very, very vigilant about, you know, thrill seekers and trespassers. So um, are you part of the, the festival that happens every year? Will you be there speaking or anything like that? You know, they have the Bell Witch Fall Festival with a lot of cool things and also the spirit play. It's done every year, and I think it's been done since about 2002. But, no, I'm not part of that. And, uh, you know, they've never asked me to be, become a part of it or anything. So, no, I'm not part of that. And since we're getting into kind of spooky season October, uh, do you have any events coming up that people can, can get tickets for or come out and see you talk? Anything going on at conventions or, or any kind of appearances? As of right now, what we do have – lined up is the Arkansas Paranormal Convention the last weekend of October in Little Rock at the MacArthur Museum of Military History. It's a very, very large uh, paranormal conference or ex expo, I guess is a better word, a large paranormal expo, usually thousands in attendance. I'll be there uh, both days, Saturday and Sunday, doing Bell Witch lectures and also will be having a book signing and meet greet. Awesome. People can come out if they're in that area of the country and, and check you out and come talk to you in person and pick your brain about any other questions they may have about the Bell Witch. Or the paranormal. Or the paranormal. Yeah, you've been investigating for many years, the paranormal also. Yeah, a whole lot of cases. And like I said, people can, uh, to find out more about the Bell Witch, you have an awesome, extensive website. I love the website, bellwitch.org. Um, it's a great place to research the Bell Witch. You've got frequently asked questions on there, and you've got myths that you kind of explain why, you know, these are myths about the Bell Witch. And the, and the whole story, I think that website is, is phenomenal. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, it started out as an individual page on a personal website I had probably back in the early 1990s, and it seemed that people were really interested in it. So in the mid, I think it was the mid to late 1990s, I set it up as its own website, and uh, it's been out there ever since. Thanks for coming on today, Pat. Really appreciate it. Everybody can go find more information about the Bell Witch at bellwitch.org. They can find your books on your website there, Amazon, and wherever fine books are sold. I'll put the link in the show notes, like I said. And thank you so much, Pat, for coming on and chatting with us today. I really enjoyed it. 
Hey, thank you. It's been my pleasure. All right, so on the phone here with uh, Pat Fitzhugh as well is Candy, and her mother is the owner of the Bell Witch Cave, and she's had many experiences. She's kind of grown up on the property, and she's lived there, so she's had lots of experiences with the cave, and she she's done tours and things like that as well. So you were just telling me uh, before we started recording that you moved there when you were 12. Yes, um, we were 12 years old when we moved there uh, in 1993. And so you've had some personal experiences in the cave with, with the paranormal aspect. Uh, yes, more than I can enumerate. <laughs> <laughs> Through the years, there has been so many times uh, being in the cave where you hear noises and voices. And like I can't, I can't stress enough how many times that has happened where you hear, it, it'll sound like somebody talking, somebody chanting, somebody singing, some kids playing, somebody stomping in the water, somebody throwing rocks, or just so many noises in there through the years. So many weird pictures has been taken in and around the cave over the years. Even in my parents' house, there has been a lot of weird things happen. And out on the farm. And of course, I know things happen in Adams also, like at the Bell School building and but I would say more in the cave than anywhere else. But there has been some pretty weird things that's happened in there over the years. Yeah, and Pat was saying that uh, with it being closed during COVID for like two years, that now it kind of has ramped up a little more active than it kind of maybe was before y'all closed it for a couple of years. Yes, we were closed for two years because of COVID, and uh, we just re- reopened June 29th and. Since we've reopened, it seems like there is a lot more physical uh, activity to where it's like people being pushed or shoved or touched. I had a young boy in the cave recently that he had the red spot on the back, and he, he said that somebody threw a rock at him, and he turned around, and nobody was back there. Uh, another young girl had scratches on her stomach. Wow. Two of my new tour guides were pushed. Um, I started a YouTube channel to start documenting some of the um, experiences that people had. And I I posted on there, one of the new tour guides was actually, she had her recorder on, on her phone. And she, like, it's kind of looking down at the floor. And when she got shoved, like, her, her the camera moved. And she was like, it's so weird. It was like somebody shoved me from the side. There's no, she said, I was in the back of the group. There's no room for anybody to stand over there to shove me. And she said, my cat, you know, like I moved over. She's like, I got it on film. And of course there's nothing there, but you know, like you can tell her camera moves where she was shoved. The other one, it shook him up pretty good. He ran all the way up the hill from the (laughs) cave. What, what happened to scare him that much? He said that he turned the lights off. And when he did, he felt hands on his back that it it wasn't like, he said that it wasn't mean or hateful. It was just like, it was kind of pushing him out of the cave. Like, okay, it's time to leave (laughs) now. Like it was pushing him towards the entrance and it got him all shook up. And they said, the cougar just come running up the hill. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, One of the things me and Pat were talking about and that I've heard a lot throughout my life, because I'm from Middle Tennessee here. I live right outside of Nashville is uh, people sending rocks and things back that they have taken out of the cave. Yeah, there there was a woman that took a rock out and went to the market in Adams and got out to go in and tripped and, and broke her leg. And, of course, later she come back down there in a cast. My dad, the woman asked my dad, like, do you care if I take this rock? And he's like, well, I'm warning you, it's bad luck. And then he said, it was just a few hours later, she came back in the gift shop and her leg was in a cast. Wow. <laughs> um, we actually just got one back the other day. The people took it out in 2018 and uh, they just sent it back. And they, they were tar- like, they sent a letter with some of the stuff that uh, had happened to them. Uh, just a lot of bad luck and uncomfortable feelings and things like that. Uh, and then I was at the doctor's office the other day, and the um, medical assistant <laughs> told me I said something about, well, I'm a tour guide at the, you know, at the cave, and 
uh, she told me that she said, we, we took a rock out years ago and we returned it um, here not too long ago. And she said, there's writing on it and it's in the second hallway. And she was talking about some of the stuff that had happened to them that they had bad luck. And her dad was the one that took it out. Her dad has since passed away. She said it was years ago, but um, that they had had all kinds of bad luck and she finally returned it. Yeah, I find that fascinating. I've I've talked to uh, some other authors who have talked about places, and I was telling Pat about the petrified forest. People, the Park Service gets pieces of petrified wood back all the time, and so I like you know to talk to somebody from the Bell Witch Cave because, like I said, I've heard it my whole life, and your family actually gets these things back from people and have actually you know hear the stories. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, the uh, lava beds in Hawaii are the yeah. same. They get tons of rock back each year yeah that's a pretty interesting phenomena so for anybody that wants to come take a tour now that you are back open where can they get tickets and when is the best time for them to come um you purchase tickets when you get there right now we are open on weekends only and then we have our october festivities start on october 7th but we are also taking reservations for special nighttime lantern tours uh, and you can do a two hour or a three hour and those are a little bit more exclusive where you have to have four people and like your group comes and we spend a lot more time with people like I kind of feel like I'm friends with them by the end of the tour we go on a tour of the cabin then we go down to the cave show them full album full of weird pictures and to the Indian burial ground and back to the haunted dale and that's the three hour tour you can do that and or the two hour you can come during regular business hours on the weekends from 10 to 6 last tour starts at 5 uh, weather permitting <laughs> everything is weather permitting it's so hard to make the call so many times on whether we should open or not because everything can get muddy so quick so always call before you come, but then on our website, uh, uh we have our Halloween festivities uh, with cave tours and cabin tours and haunted hay rides that's coming up in October. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing the stories. And everybody go, if you're in the area, go check out the place, go do a lantern tour. Um, I might have to come up there myself and do a lantern tour. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, well, just let me know. (laughs) All right, Candy, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. All right, everybody, stay safe out there. Have a good day. We'll see you next time. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, head over to The Unseen Paranormal Lounge on Facebook for all the latest updates and discussions about the show. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, or at unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe to help more people discover the show. The Unseen Paranormal Podcast is proud to be the ambassador for paranormal for Verbal.com. A big thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. You can find more of his music on Apple, Amazon, or Spotify. And as always, thank you for listening.